Hello and welcome to another episode of our Women in STEM series. My name is Kaylee Peel and I'm the Director of Development for the Linda Hall Library. And today our guests are very special because they're a part of our very own Linda Hall Library team. Joining me today is Tony Batasso. She's our coordinator for research and scholarship. And we've also got Allison Marsh. She's one of our on-site fellows and she's representing our collaboration with the National Endowment for the Humanities. Ladies, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you so thank much. You. So Tony, I want to start with you. Could you give, for those who are listening and who might not be familiar, could you give an overview of our fellowship program and the focus that your department really works on? Um, so we're really, really lucky. We kind of sit in this awesome space that we get to support humanity scholars. Mm -hmm. So our whole program is there to support historians of science and the, their fields mm -hmm. as well as the humanities. So since 2011, we have supported over 150 scholars and we're really, really fortunate to do that. Mm -hmm. Allison is one of our many scholars. And it's really exciting for the program. I'm also a historian, so I get to work in that field and support our scholars. So research has obviously changed over the last couple of years, particularly around the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from both of you, how did that change from the fellowship standpoint, but also Allison as a standalone researcher? Yeah, I mean, when the entire world closed down, that meant that we did not have access to all of the resources, the rich resources of museums, of libraries, you know, getting in there and being able to really look at the, the real stuff. Um, and so different institutions approached it in different ways. And one of the great things about the Linda Hall Library is that they were already in a place uh, with their infrastructure to really pivot to the world of digital. And so they've been um, sort of at the forefront of offering virtual fellowships. And I'll let you say a little bit more yeah, about that. So since the pandemic happened, we all know this happened in 2020, we pivoted to offer virtual fellowships. So that first year we pivoted completely virtual. Now we've kind of tapered off a little bit, but not really. We still offer general fellowships. Those are to researchers coming in the building mm -hmm. here, but we also still offer virtual fellowships, and that is spectacular. You never know what is going on in a researcher's life. There are children, there are concerns, there are family needs. Also, moving your whole life, mm -hmm. as it, you did, it is. <laughs> it's very, very difficult, and we have really pushed to keep the virtual fellowships alive and make sure that no matter where you are in the world, we have fellows right now that are all over the world because mm -hmm. of our virtual fellowships, mm -hmm. and we've really pushed to the forefront. I during the pandemic was writing my master's thesis. I was finishing up and it was, would have been really exciting to have a place where there was infrastructure and a lot of places didn't pivot. So mm -hmm. being able to work in that space helps scholars to continue their research even if they can't come in person is an amazing part of our program. And I think one of the parts uh, that I've been really excited about, at least with our strategic plan and the movement of our mission at the library, we're making things more accessible. Mm -hmm. And you guys have illustrated that really well, so thank you. Yeah library doesn't just focus on, of course we're a science library, mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering, mathematics, it's in our name, but we also focus on the humanities and there's a really beautiful mm -hmm. um, kind of dance and blend that happens here at the library with that. Um, so Allison, you have a really unique background. You are kind of at the intersection of science and research. Could you tell me your kind of your career journey? <laughs> I know it's, it might be an interesting I one. Mean, it has been a journey. Sure. So I've had, um, you know, many different types of careers. So as an undergraduate, I actually majored in engineering. Mm -hmm. I was uh, an electrical engineer, and I worked in technical consulting for several years. Uh, then, you know, I wanted a, a change. I went back to school. I got my PhD in the history of technology, but I wanted to work in a museum. And so I ended up working as a curator at the Smithsonian at the oh. National Postal Museum um, in charge of their three-dimensional collections, their engineering collections. A lot of people don't think of the Postal Museum as an engineering collection, but mm -hmm. it's really high tech. Um, and then uh, later on, I was recruited uh, to be a, um, uh, to teach at the University of South Carolina to um, work in their public history program and uh, really oversee their museum studies track there. Okay. So, uh, I, yeah, so I've gone yeah. three different places. Uh, so academia, you know, the museum sector, mm -hmm. and then the tech sector as well. What do you think um, was one of your biggest kind of aha moments in each of those sectors? And, and what kind of made you 
take this next step into research? Is there something that you want people to know whenever talking about these types of careers? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, if I look back on my career and I try to see, like, what is the through line of what am I always interested in doing? And I think both as an engineer, as a museum professional, as an academic, I really am interested in how the general public comes to understand complex engineering ideas. Yeah. So whether I'm doing the actual research or if I'm uh, public speaking or if I'm you know, teaching, I want to see how to get people excited mm -hmm. about the science and technology that's sort of often behind the scenes. I do feel that engineers are sort of the unsung heroes. Mm -hmm. I think that they are the people who really make the world work. Um, politicians might disagree with me, but <laughs> underlying <laughs> everything is, you know, technology. It's what brings us here today. So, you know, bringing that from behind the scenes and up to the front to show people what it takes to make these things happen. Yeah, that makes total sense. Thank you for sharing that. When, I, when you've talked a little bit about, you know, I think there are a lot of aspects of research and I would say STEM and science that are very complex, as mm -hmm. you said. But I think that there are a lot of complex issues and topics that are kind of covered by the fellowship program, if I'm right. Could you yes, talk a little definitely. bit about what are you trying to attract when it comes to fellows coming into your fellowship program yeah. currently, but also moving into the future, Tony? Yeah, we really are trying to bring in groups that haven't been able to speak or do research and mm -hmm. bring those stories to the forefront. The unsung heroes, I think, is a very important role we also i think often people often say well why science if i'm a historian of this topic why should i look at science will i find something in your library and i think one thing that we've been really excited about is our rare book history mm -hmm. and bringing in bibliographers and bringing in people who often say oh that doesn't work for us mm -hmm. but they they do and they can come in and we have these rare books and even if it's not on a topic they're used to it's beautiful to watch them work. I think you got yes, to see one absolutely. of our bibliographers work, but no matter the project, I think this library is so rich with the sources, and I think that's a beautiful part of my job as well as my boss's job, mm -hmm. getting to see other historians, other scholars do the research and watch them flourish and watch the projects come to life. I love coming out and talking to you every day and seeing what new things you've brought to the table for us. And I love talking with the other fellows because everyone has such unique, different mm -hmm. projects spanning time, space, mm -hmm. um, geographies, you know, thematic takes, all yeah. different and they're all fascinating. Well, let's get into that a little bit. So first, Tony, I wanna, I wanna hear what are some of the other fellows working on that are currently mm -hmm. on site with the library and moving into 2025? But then I wanna get to you, Allison. I wanna hear all about the research you're working on right now, the 21st. Yeah, so currently we have one fellow looking at the, the history of AI, which, wow. and seeing how that spans. And it's <laughs> very, very of the moment, mm -hmm. and it's very important to see like the first, um, proposals that were brought up in the 1950s, and that's been amazing. We also have a scholar working on horticulture and the history of horticulture in Canada, Scotland, and the United States, wow. and it's a very interesting project. Um, also linguistics, we're working on, one of our fellows has a project on linguistics in the Iberian Peninsula in the 17th century, which wow spans the time span is incredible um, in the new year we'll be bringing in um, scholars working on early america to the 1980s mm -hmm. so it's really fascinating all of the projects um, and i think allison your project definitely spans <laughs> a very long no. At least Period. a century. <laughs> yeah. So okay. A more. So, yeah. so i am uh, researching the early years of the electric of electrical engineering so when it becomes a profession when it becomes a discipline but i'm specifically looking at women in the field mm -hmm. and if you know anything about electrical engineering today it is not a predominantly female field um, today it's still about 12 percent female um, and i want to get it to the root of why mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to look back to the founding of the field you know 1880s or so and start uncovering some of the early women who really uh, contributed to ideas of electrical engineering and you know a lot of people are like oh well, no women just weren't there they didn't participate and of course we know that that's wrong mm -hmm. women have always been there and my job is to sort of go through all of the society um, 
minutes and their uh, proceedings to see where do the women actually show up. And they come up in you know, some usual places and then some also very unexpected places mm -hmm. as well. So. Do you think that, um, is your experience personally in like a STEM ecosystem as a career person, mm -hmm. is that at all paralleled to some of the things that you're finding in your research? I mean, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, and unfortunately that 100 years ago there would be only one woman in the classroom and, you know, when I was taking classes I also was sometimes mm -hmm. the only woman in my class. And honestly that was true both in my engineering undergraduate, but as well as my doctoral program mm -hmm. in the history of technology. Um, I was the only woman for several years of mm -hmm. cohorts. Uh, it's interesting, you know, who, who decides to go where and how do they, you know, make their place. And so there were women who were pioneers, you know, 100, you know, 30 years ago, and there are women who are still pioneers today. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great mm -hmm. to know. I think that it's what's been interesting about the, some of the conversations I've had in the series is that regardless of the field or sector that a woman is in, they're often feeling this at some point in their mm -hmm. life, right? Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear, um, you know, not just from your research side and your background, but Tony, you're in academia. You have more of an academic lens. Yeah. What are the experiences of women from that standpoint? Is it similar to women in STEM when it comes to kind of this one woman in the room, and how have you kind of navigated that in your time? Yes, I think most definitely. I think that's a, a story and a through line. Um, I worked as a military historian. That's mm -hmm. I'm kind of I toe that line, and also as a cultural military historian, mm -hmm. I was the only one often in my classes or in the room and in conversations. Um, the first time I really didn't see that was when I worked in museums, and mm -hmm. I was really really fortunate that the military museums that I worked in had really strong women who also empowered me and I was very, very lucky that mm -hmm. they kind of said, "This you're gonna come into this and this is gonna be part of your journey, but if you are just, you insert yourself mm -hmm. and you are there, um, it is important. And I think that was very, very helpful. I think most, I think anybody, um, but primarily I felt imposter syndrome and mm. trying to feel if I was right in the room, if I knew everything. And in those male dominated fields, it can be even more there. Um, and I don't know if you also. I know, I, like, <laughs> I mean, everybody has those moments yeah. of self doubt, but yes. um, I also might have, you know, too much self-confidence <laughs> and so <laughs> I have a tendency to just plow ahead regardless of whether it's not the right path to do or not but you know it's who I am and I wanted to be there so I'm gonna you know stake my claim and you know we have a lot of people throughout history who that's yeah. what they've done and mm -hmm. so you know who knows if all of those historical actors also had imposter syndrome mm -hmm. but yeah. you know what they got recorded in history and yeah. we are now praising them. Yeah. Well, and I think we need those torch bear, like, carriers, right? Yeah. And, and it does yeah. take a community and it does take a cachet of women who are supporting each other and mentoring one another for us to be mm -hmm. successful in the long run. So I totally, I love that you guys yeah. are, are kind of finding those connections. What would you want, um, so this is a question for both of you, um, from a fellowship perspective, but also um, from a history of science perspective, what do you want the general audience to know about women in your fields and then women moving into the future? What are things that we should be knowing and taking better care of? I think it's important to let women know that they're necessary in that space. Mm -hmm. I think going forward, they matter in history. And it also, I think something that we work and we pride ourselves in the Linda Hall Library Fellowship cohort creation um, is making sure that everybody has a space at the table and that they can tell their story and that they can use these sources and that they matter and mm -hmm. the story they're telling matters. And I think that's important to let everybody know. Um, we just opened our new fellowship um, application cycle and we want people, no matter who they are, no matter how they identify with, knowing that they are important and that they can come and tell the story of the history of science, technology, and engineering and the humanities as yeah, well. Absolutely. And I think that was a fabulous answer because, you know, women do belong um, both in the academy, in the research mm -hmm. area, in the workforce, mm -hmm. at any type of career that they want to pursue, whether that is in the sciences and engineering, whether they decide, like myself, mid-career to shift into the humanities, mm -hmm. you know, find that space because, uh, you know, it is open to you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, ladies, for your time. I'm excited to see the momentum of the fellowship program, but also I can't wait to dig into your research once, once it's ready. So thank you both, ladies. Thank okay. you. Thank you.